Don't be like you're not going to know me. I'm waiting. The person who's not from Brooklyn was like, "Career? Career? 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 Career?
how things in fact have responded to environmental change in the past so that we can anticipate whether or not this type of perspective on species movement and species dynamics is in fact what we think will come to pass. And so the first question that I think is important to, to anticipate when we're looking at a map like this is how dynamically will species, do we expect species to in fact respond to, uh, to environmental change, to, to climate change? So should we expect some of these dynamic range shifts to occur as temperatures are changing? And my uh, postdoc, Yue Wang, uh, who's pictured here, has been doing a lot of research looking at plant biomes and plant ecosystems to start to address this question of how dynamically do systems, in fact, respond to temperature change. And this is a project that's funded by uh, NSF. And so in order to do this, she's been looking back at the incredible fossil record of uh, pollen from North America over the last 20,000 years. And so what you can see here, these are uh, 358 core sites from all over North America. And you can see that they're pretty well represented. But these core sites don't in fact represent individual single samples. There's actually a third dimension to them. So if you zoom in on one of these core sites, what you end up seeing is each one of these points uh, is represented by at least one core of sediment. And these sediment cores have been sampled where the red lines are for pollen granules. And so what we end up having, I'm gonna pull this over so that it'll actually detect. And so what we end up having is, whoa, it detected, look at that. All right, and so what we end up having is each one of these samples represents a full sample of the community of pollen that was collected at that, that was, uh, you know, just, uh, that, that ended up being collected in that soil uh, at that time period. And so we have all of these samples from oldest to youngest within that core at each one of these sites. And so we end up with over 14,000 pollen samples. This is an average of 40, sam uh, 40 samples per core. Uh, in with which we can look at the relative abundance of pollen at each one of these sites through time. And so we can get a sense of how the communities have changed across North America on this time period. Now, in order to look at this, what we've done is we've taken each one of these pollen samples and we've translated it into plant biomes. And so the way that we've done this is we've used identified modern pollen samples that were taken from known plant biomes. And we've said, okay, for this pollen sample, what, is the, what are the five most similar modern pollen samples to this pollen sample? And uh, this is uh, how we are, and then we weight that in order to determine which plant biome looks most like each one of these pollen samples. And so, this is what we mean by plant biomes. We have 10 plant biomes that we're looking at across North America. These are things like uh, deserts or boreal forests or um, Mediterranean vegetation. Uh, this is what we're listing as these 10 plant biomes. And then uh, sometimes there are pollen samples that, that fall outside of some of the modern biomes that we see today. And so uh, these end up being categorized as no analog biomes. So there are biomes that were present and pretty prevalent in the past, uh, generally you know, closer to the last glacial maximum, that are no longer very frequent or very common today. And these uh, no analog biomes are divided into mixed parkland and spruce parkland. And so now that we have these 12 plant biomes, in reality, we, we ended up using 11 because we have very few Mediterranean plant biomes in the pollen samples. Uh, the questions that we were asking are, what is the resonance time of vegetation biomes within these cores in North America? That's to say, how long did a forest persist before it transitioned to a prairie or a grassland, right? And another way to think about this is, uh, it asks the question, how frequently do these biomes transition? 
And so in order to calculate the resonance time, this is again another one of these cores. And what we've done is we've identified these cores, uh, these individual samples within the core, here's the old, here's the young, as deciduous forest, prairie, uh, and then again, it came back to being a deciduous forest. And so for residence time, we calculated it as the minimum biome duration for each one of these plant biomes. And then we also were able to calculate the recovery time. So the recovery time is calculated as the minimum distance between two instances of a biome when it was recovering back potentially to that from a deciduous forest back to a deciduous forest. And so these are the two calculations that we made. And uh, what, one of the challenges that we had when we're using these types of data in order to do these types of temporal reconstructions is that uh, there are different types of samples from all of these different types of cores, right? So we have 360 cores. These were all collected by different people. Um, and sometimes the sampling resolution can vary. And sometimes the core lengths can vary depending on the, the site that it was taken from or the type of study. And so uh, these types of issues can, can pose potential problems. So if the sampling resolution is too long, it can sometimes miss certain transitions. And if the um, core length is too short, it can sometimes truncate, uh, it can sometimes truncate a biome so that it appears to be shorter than it is. And so in order to get around this, we, did two, we, we took two different approaches. One approach was to, um, was to perform a series of sensitivity analyses to see the extent to which these different effects were in fact affecting our data. We end up having some effects uh, from truncation, particularly at the edges of our data on the, on the young and old edges, and particularly when looking at recovery time, because of course, things are no longer recovering now because we don't have any new biomes, right? So we ended up truncating our data a little bit um, on the, the young, especially on the young side of things. And then we also uh, did a subsampling of our data so that we looked at a high resolution data set, which has a relatively small sample size, uh, but it used uh, cores that were very long in length and it used uh, very high sampling resolution. And when we did this, we ended up with a median residence time of 230 years for plant biomes, for, for plant biomes across North America. And we also took uh, these, a lower resolution data set with a much larger sample size where we, were able, where we were using cores that were a bit shorter, still quite long, still more than a thousand years, um, and a slightly lower sampling resolution. Sampling resolution, it ended up, we did a sensitivity analysis, didn't end up mattering quite as much as, uh, as core length uh, at times. And so we ended up with a median residence time with this data set of 460 years. So we feel fairly confident uh, after we've done all of these different sensitivity analyses that our residence times are somewhere around, median residence times are somewhere around 300 years for all plant biomes across North America, which in my mind is pretty fast. This is median residence time, of course, of all biomes. Some specific sites might you know, persist for a couple thousand years. You know, the plant biome just persists there for several thousand years. And there's certain places that just turn over and turn over really quickly. Um, but in general, this is happening quite fast. Plants are turn over, turning over quite fast. And so if we actually you know, break it down by the individual biomes, what we end up finding at these, is that these grass and shrubland types of biomes end up having a very short residence time on the order of 360 years with a recovery time of around 260 years. Whereas forest biomes have much longer residence times on the order of 700 years. Now, of course, this makes sense because they're trees and trees are much more long lived, right? Um, and then the recovery time for forests are on the order of 360 years. So a little bit longer, maybe not quite as long as we might expect. And so what we can see here are the individual responses of each of these individual biome types, which I'm happy to discuss or, or show you a little bit more detail later. And so uh, what this is showing you is the frequency of each biome within our pollen samples. So you can see that we have a lot of deciduous forests and fewer mountain vegetation or spruce parkland uh, plant biomes. 
And it also can show you the uh, transition probability and the transition frequency for each of these. And you can see that, you know, generally a plant biome, a biome is staying as the same biome. And then the transition probabilities for each of these um, biomes ends up making a lot of sense, such that deciduous forests are frequently uh, transitioning to either conifer forests or prairies. Uh, and forest tundra are frequently transitioning from forest tundra to uh, boil forests. Uh, so just as a, as, a, as a checking apparatus, the transition probabilities from one uh, plant biome to another plant biome does in fact make sense as far as the types of transitions that you would anticipate. So if we start to look at the patterns of residence time, uh, we can think of a couple different ways to look at these patterns. And one of the ways is to look at the spatial pattern of residence time and where, whether or not, you know, uh, more alpine regions or, or uh, higher latitude regions end up having um, a longer residence time or a shorter residence time perhaps than, than uh, a lower latitude region. But the reality is that we find no um, consistent pattern in residence time uh, based on latitudinal gradient. And here what you're seeing is glacial retreat from 20,000 until the present. And you'll see the appearance of these different residence times. Dark green is a longer residence time and pale green is a shorter residence time. And we end up seeing a similar sort of pattern for recovery times. Again, we have no latitudinal pattern when we're looking at the recovery time of these plant biomes. But if we start to look at the pattern through time, we start to see a different picture. And so this is the residence time, the median residence time of all of the plant biomes through time. And so what you're seeing, here's 20,000 years ago, here's the present. Paleontologists always put it that way because the past is to the left, yeah back then. <laughs> um, and so uh, a less stable bi plant biome or a, high, a shorter residence time means that the turnover is happening faster, right? And so that's down here toward the bottom of the graph. And a more stable uh, plant biomes are up here toward the top of the graph. And there's a lot of different events that have occurred over the past 20,000 years in North America. So. Uh, Again, we have the glacial retreats that we we're just seeing in that past uh, map. We have uh, Native Americans, probably didn't look like him, that arrived in, in North America. Um, we have in Pleistocene megafauna extinction when, uh, you know, all of the, not all, m most of the large bodied mammals on the terrestrial landscape uh, went extinct. Uh, we have a period of relative climate stability during the Holocene. And then of course we have the industrial revolution and modern times occurring now. And you can already start to see that there's a bit of a pattern here, but it's actually a really interesting pattern because uh, until previously, uh, it was really thought that there's been a lot of emphasis on the fact that at the times humans arrived around the time when uh, megafauna went extinct and therefore humans are the ones that directly caused this megafauna extinction. Right, um, But what we can see from this graph is that uh, plant biomes were already experiencing very short residence times prior to human arrival in North America. And likely there is a destabilization and a lot of ecosystem turnover resulting in you know, a lot of issues, ecological issues for megafauna already from the bottom up as a bottom up response to plant dynamics and plant changes. And this actually is co-occurring with the glacial retreat. So when we start to have these very short residence times, it's about the time when the glaciers start retreating in North America. And in fact, what we end up seeing is that this ends up corresponding with uh, the time, the period of, of very low residence times corresponds with times, this time of really uh, rapid temperature change. If we pull that apart, and look at rate of temperature change versus the residence time, we end up seeing a very strong relationship between 
residence time and amount of and temperature change, such that we end up having uh, 260 years uh, change in residence time per degree century. Except recently. And so what we end up seeing on the, this far end of the graph of residence times is that we've already started to experience a downturn in residence times starting around 4,000 years ago. And this is, uh, this is, this is, uh, coincides with a major change in uh, Native American culture that occurred about that time. Uh, and so the thought is that this has to do with agricultural and population booms and has in fact continued up until this day. So the fact that this destabilization uh, plus human arrival in North America kind of could have served as a one-two punch in order for the megafauna uh, Pleistocene extinction to have occurred. And now we're again seeing this downturn in plant biome residence times indicates that we are potentially in a lot of trouble because of the fact that we know humans are causing, again, a lot of turmoil on the landscape at the same time as climate is changing and plant biome residence times are already fairly short. Fairly, uh, short. And so what we can anticipate based on this work is really dynamic shifts in coming years. So the median residence times that we observe for North American plant biomes are on the order of 300 years. But temperature changes since 20,000 years ago is 10 times slower than the current rate. So these turnover rates are likely to continue to increase. Uh, and, and so these, these residence times are already starting to be short following this agricultural expansion. And this is foreboding uh, potential extinctions to come. So we know that the plant biomes are likely to shift quite dynamically in response to rapid climate change. But are they actually going to be able to shift enough in order to track projected climate change? When we're thinking about this, we need to think about the fact that humans now are having a huge impact on the landscape. So this is a map from uh, Dave Theobald. It's a little bit old, 2010, landscape ecology. There's more recent maps out, but this is the one I used at the time, um, of the human impact on the landscape in North America. And you can see very high human impacts are in purple and yellow, and then lower human impacts are in, in green. And what we did was we thought about, so if something is living in one of these natural land areas, could it in fact uh, move far enough in order to outrun projected climate change? Could it move out of the way of where we have projected climate change without having to cross some of these human habitat fragmented areas, these regions of high human impact? And so what we said is, is if something is living here, could it move, could it, could it traverse natural landscapes far enough to be able to get up into this blue area and outrun projected climate change. And so in order to do that, it's kind of a computationally challenging issue because if you look at this land patch and you say, okay, what's the coldest temperature it can get to, there could be lots of different paths that it could take, right? And so in order to calculate this, what we did was we instead took the cold temperatures and we cascaded them backward down the uh, network. So we created a network of adjacent land patches and then cascaded the temperatures backwards. So we said, okay, for this four degrees Celsius patch, is it connected to a colder patch? The answer is no. For the five degrees Celsius patch, is it connected to a colder patch? The answer is yes. Therefore, it could reach a four degrees Celsius land patch, right? So it's just a very simple, what's the fur furthest temperature, coldest temperature, that, uh, that this is connected to, each one is connected to. And so we cascaded this back down through the network of connected adjacent landscapes. And then if something was not connected to any other, then it just maintained its same destination temperature. Things are kind of stuck wandering around in there, right? And so the answer, the average, on average, things can move about two degrees Celsius. And you can see that, you know, in the West, is a lot more dark blue, up to 13 degrees Celsius, right? Probably overkill, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully things don't need to move three degrees Celsius. Um, 
And then in the east, you have a lot of very pale blue. Uh, but this didn't quite get at the question, right? So we're wondering not just how far can they go, what's the temperature, coldest temperature they could get to, but could they in fact outrun projected change? So could they actually go far enough? And so we used projected temperatures um, in order to look at could they, what's the differential, right? Could they in fact outrun projected climate change? And here's what we found. So by moving just through adjacent natural areas, something, uh, the amount of land area, 41% of natural land area could achieve climate connectivity. And so the blue areas are areas where climate connectivity is possible. And of course, the West has a lot of connectivity and therefore climate connectivity. Um, and you can, you'll see that the East is, is quite red and things are not being able to achieve uh, climate connectivity in the West. But again, this didn't quite get at what we were wanting to know. We wanted to know then how, how much was habitat fragmentation in fact impeding the ability of things to be able to track temperature and able to, things to be able to, to track climate across the landscape. And so in order to think about this, we created a map that to, to, to ask the question, you know, what would happen if human land use were not an issue? And to do this, we ended up making climate gradient corridors for contiguous United States and buffered into uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, and these are um, corridors that would connect a warmer patch to a colder patch by finding the shortest, uh, the least cost path uh, that, that combines the shortest distance. Uh, it uh, avoids areas of high human impact and uh, would calculate regions that had the shallowest climate gradient. And so it would calculate the, this least cost path as a climate gradient corridor. And so using these climate gradient corridor, oh, one more thing, detail, whoops is that uh, we only were connecting patches within 100 kilometers of one another, um, and there had to be some temperature gradient between them in order for them to be connected. Um, partly a computational issue uh, at the time, at least. So. so this is the map that I flash up for two seconds that took you know six months to make at the time. <laughs> um, uh, but so here's our, our map of climate gradient corridors. And what we use this for is to then create a new network. So this new network was adjacent patches plus patches that were connected by climate gradient corridors to see what would happen if things were actually able to move across fra fragmented areas uh, to, in order to track climate. And so once we did this, what we found was that now 65% of natural areas can achieve climate connectivity if they're able to move across these fragmented areas using some kind of uh, climate gradient corridor. And you'll see there's a lot more blue in the east and there is also a lot more blue in the west. And what we end up seeing is that there's a 25% increase in um, connectivity, uh, climate connectivity as a result of allowing things to move across these fragmented landscapes. Um, so to walk you through this map, Blue areas are areas that are able to succeed when things are just moving through adjacent land, land areas. Red areas are able, areas that only succeed if things are able to move through corridors. And then gray areas are regions that never are able to achieve climate connectivity. Uh, the interesting thing that we see here is that uh, this 25% increase is even across the contiguous United States. So we have a 25% increase in the West which brings us to from 50 to about 75%. But we also have a 25% increase in the east, which brings us from 2% to 27%. So that differential in the east is likely more important, right, than the differential in the west, because we're starting with such low climate connectivity to begin with. And in fact, if we look at that map, uh, that flowing map, which we will in a little bit, uh, what we end up seeing is that a lot of species are projected to need to move through the eastern corridor, through the eastern portion of the United States. Um, but when we're thinking about this, this in fact doesn't affect all species equally, right? So some species 
are more affected by habitat fragmentation than others. And this is a question that my postdoc, Silvia Pineda Munoz, has been looking at recently. Um, she's been asking in the question, to what extent do humans influence different mammals? And so in order to look at this, uh, what one would often do when one's thinking about, so how much is, uh, how well are species going to be able to move in order to track their predicted climate, right? Uh, one would also often go out and look and see where are these mammal species living today, right? So we, we go out, we say, where did they live today? What are the climates that they're living in today? And uh, therefore, how are these climates going to shift into the future? And therefore, where will the species be able to survive in the future? But what she was interested in doing is considering, again, the fact that humans, I mean, to this point, have modified 75% of natural land area, right? And so we're asking this question, are these mammals, are they actually living where they should be living? Are they living in the climates today that they you know, normally would be living in if we hadn't you know, dominated with agriculture and urban regions? And so she was asking whether uh, modern mammals have in fact changed their habitat preferences as humans expanded their footprint on the landscape, uh, whether or not changes in land use are shaping the niche preferences of where these North American mammals are living, and how well these different species in fact tolerate anthropogenic impacts. And so to think about this, let's take a step back and think a little bit about niche theory. So I just wanna walk us through the language of niche theory. Probably many of you know this already, but um, let's think about the fundamental niche of a species. So the fundamental niche is the set of environmental conditions in which a species can uh, survive, reproduce, and grow its population. Uh, however, at any given point in time, there is some subset of that fundamental niche that is in fact available, right? So maybe something can live in, you know, five millimeters of rain and uh, two degrees Celsius, but that doesn't actually exist on the landscape uh, when it's a hothouse earth, right? Uh, so perhaps only some subset of the environment, the fundamental niche of that species is in fact available at any, any given point in time. And this is, uh, which results in a potential niche, right? So this is the potential niche that's available on the landscape at any point in time. This potential niche is then further limited by interspecific interactions and the ability of the species to disperse potentially. And so what we, the uh, region that we actually are finding a species in, uh, the, real, the region of environmental space where we're actually finding the species is called the realized niche. Um, and so what we're interested in thinking about is how much are humans impacting the realized niche of the species, where we actually see the species on the landscape today. And so in order to do this, we compared the realized niches of species at different time points. And so we divided up uh, our time periods and we've done Again, a trillion sensitivity analyses to see how much time binning and things like that affected these issues. Um, uh, during a time of relatively stable climate, and so climate's not changing a lot in North America, from 12,000 years ago up until the present. And we divided this up into some anthropogenically relevant time periods. So uh, 12,000 years ago until 4,000 years ago, this is a time period when species are recovering from the, the survivors, I call them, are, are recovering from emplacedocene extinctions. Uh, we have the agricultural period. This is a period when a Native American footprint is really expanding and spreading on the landscape uh, up until 1500, when we have European arrival. Uh, then we have European arrival. Uh, the next time period we have is the uh, Industrial Revolution in North America. 1850 to 1950, and then of course we have present or modern times. And so we looked at this across 46 different North American mammal species for which we had sufficient data, sufficient fossil data for the most part, 
Um, and this is, these are species that are spanning six different orders. And what we end up seeing, what we ended up uh, looking at was the realized niche of the species when compared to the available environment, the available background environment. So I'll just walk you through this for the American bison. Uh, this, these are the uh, fossil localities where the American bison was found uh, during the post-glacial post period. And here you have an outline which represents the realized environment of North America during that time period. And then this uh, shaded area is the um, realized niche of the American bison during that post-glacial time period. And so what we ended up doing was looking at uh, this, each species, each of these 46 species for each of these five time periods. And what you can see is both the uh, available environment and the, um, and the realized niche of the species end up shifting across that time period. And so what we did was we wanted to compare the overlap in species realized niches relative to the available environment through across those time periods. And by overlap, overlap is fairly simple to understand. Uh, the relative part is a little less, but here's a low overlap of a species in the past compared to, say, a present time period. This is represented by a purple color if there's low overlap. If there's high overlap between a species niche in the past and the present, then it's represented by a green color. And so when we're looking at the American bison, what we end up seeing is from post-glacial to agricultural time, it's about 75% overlap. When we look at agricultural to European time, we have about 71% overlap. And then we have this big drop from European to industrial where we have only 45% overlap. And then again, from industrial to the present time period, there's 60% overlap. And so if we look across all 46 of these mammal species, what we end up seeing, and this is again, this is comparing each one of these time periods to the present time period. And so when we're looking from each one of these time periods to the present time period, what we end up seeing is a really huge drop between the European and the industrial time period. So the, the, the overlap in the realized niche ends up being very low, um, very low in the, uh, both the industrial and the present time periods relative to the entire rest of that species uh, existence in the Holocene. So in order to look at whether or not human land use was in fact uh, affecting this uh, shift in mammalian niches, what we did was we created niches, climate niches, for urban and cropland areas. So we said, okay, what are the climate spaces where we're building cities and where we're uh, starting to do, you know, performing agriculture, whatever, growing crops, sure. So, uh, so we came up with a climate niche uh, for a realized niche for each of these types of land use areas. And we then compared, we said, okay, how much did the niche of this species used to overlap with the urban or the, or the agricultural uh, niche as compared in the past as compared to how much it overlaps with that niche today. And so in this example, what you're seeing is in the past, there was a 30% overlap. And in the present, there's a 60% overlap. So this is a positive overlap difference. And so this species is moving into, in this case, an urban niche. It's being shifting its niche from, uh, from less, from being less uh, corresponding with an urban niche to more. And so this is represented by yellow here. Uh, this species is being facilitated potentially by urban regions. Uh, for an, a different species, you might see the opposite pattern, such that it used to overlap a lot with areas that, are, that urban regions are now found in, and it no longer overlaps very much with an urban area. This would be a negative uh, overlap difference, and this would be indicated by a purple color. And so, what we in, and so just to give you one more example, here let's look at the puma. 
what we see with the puma is that during post-glacial time periods, this is the climatic niche that it occupied. You can see the dark colors here. During present time periods, this is the climatic niche that it occupies. You can see there's a lot of dark color down here. There's a little bit of pale pink up here. It's a little hard to see, I recognize. Um, and then when we compare this to the niche of a cropland, what we see is that in post-glacial times, there was an overlap with where croplands are today found of 60%. And then if you look at the present, the overlap between a cropland and present times, there is only, now there's only a 21% overlap. And so this is a difference in overlap of negative 40%. So it's, it's shifted out of the regions where agricultural regions are being found. The climates, it's being shifting out of the climates where agricultural regions are being found. You can think of this as the impact of cropland use, right? And so this is the answer with all 46 of our species, what we end up finding. And you'll notice it's not, it's not all straightforward. Not all species are shifting away from anthropogenically in, impacted lands. And so here on the left, you have urban up this left column. And on the right hand, we have croplands. And what you see is that, in fact, large-bodied species, which are represented over here, are, uh, are far and away shifting away from anthropogenically affected landscapes. And some of these very small species and species that are, are generally are more generalist, uh, have more generalist diets, are shifting, in fact, shifting into anthropogenically impacted landscapes. And that, I mean, that kind of makes sense intuitively, right? We know that squirrels like urban landscapes, right? <laughs> um, so, but there's, there's actually, you know, there's actually some really interesting species that end up being on here um, that, that uh, Microtus pensylvanicus, for example, that's a Pennsylvania vole, um, is in fact mediated, it looks like, by anthropogenic regions, at least slightly, uh, compared to fossil specimens from the Holocene. Uh, the interesting thing in thinking about this is this type of, of approach can give us a human impact index. So it can tell us the extent to which uh, human landscape use is affecting these different species. And so the result of kind of these types, uh, this type of, of response of these different species to human land take use, you know, here we're seeing urban landscape and agricultural landscape, and we can compare that to, there you go, desert landscapes and alpine landscapes, which we also looked at overlap with, with these different uh, types of habitats, temperatures, climates, and precipitations. And we end up seeing that uh, a lot of these small generalist species are thriving, and they're thriving these more moderate climates that are now dominated by human landscape uses. And they're in fact shifting into some of these more moderate climates where they didn't used to have quite as much prevalence there. And a lot of the large bodied, more charismatic species are being shifted into these more marginal uh, environments, such as you know, alpine wildernesses or desert regions uh, where there's lower overall productivity. Um, and so they're, they're being shifted out of some of these more temperate, uh, more moderate climates into some of these more extreme environments, which has the potential to uh, leave us with lots of, lots of boring little weedy squirrels and not many cool charismatic metafauna going forward if we don't change these trends. And so given all of these findings, uh, how can we actually use these knowledge this knowledge gained from these paleoecology uh, paleo to directly inform conservation prioritization strategies. Maybe directly is a little too much. <laughs> to inform conservation uh, prioritization strategies. Um, are we actually seeing things respond in kind of this linear manner? And we're still working on some of these linear, you know, are they actually moving in this way as well? So, um, so, what we end up seeing is that this increasing uh, plant biome resilience is going to, uh, has increased, is likely increased extinction vulnerability. But one thing that we can potentially start to do 
is to uh, start to uh, is, is mitigate the issues of resilience and to try to bolster the resilience of some of our plant biomes and some of our plant ecosystems. And how do we increase resilience? Well, we know what the characteristics of a resilient system are. They are uh, regions that have high connectivity, that have high functional redundancy, and that have high richness. And so increasing, uh, so focusing on regions that have uh, resilient systems and trying to increase resilience by increasing connectivity and um, richness in these regions, very important potential uh, impact. We know that these human impacts are going to uh, prevent some of these species from being able to track changing climates. And again, uh, increasing landscape connectivity will potentially uh, mitigate this issue as well. So uh, finding ways to allow things to dynamically shift on the landscape. However, not all species need to be treated equally, right? So we don't have to worry necessarily as much about some of these smaller species that, that in fact are mediated by human impacted regions. We should focus our efforts and focus our corridor strategies and we could even in fact weight some of our um, resistance layers using these uh, human impact, using a human impact type of index of evaluating how much humans um, affect and human impacts affect these different species. However, the fact that we see this really large change um, in the niches, the realized niches of species from the past to, the, to today is indicative that, that a lot of these uh, strategies that we're taking to try to reconstruct the modern niches of a species and use the current niche of a species in order to project how they're going to respond to future change isn't really capturing where the species can live. So we really need to think hard about what is the niche that we're modeling and how are we doing these types of predictions. And one strategy that we could take if we don't want to do something like uh, try to look at um, physiological limits of a species, we could potentially look at the past uh, niches of a species to try to determine what are, what's the full suite of niches that that species could survive in in order to try to expand our potential future projections of where species will be able to survive in the future. But the fact that things are really marginalized, many species are marginalized today, means that we need to be very careful about thinking about what climate a species in fact would prefer to live in. I meant to say that on that slide, whatever. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we can anticipate that biomes are in fact going to re respond dynamically to changing climates. And so we need some conservation strategies that are going to anticipate change. And so some of these conservation strategies include things like the Nature Conservancy has been dis uh, developing to identify and connect resilient systems, right? Uh, and like the brand new Eastern Wildways map here, uh, that, uh, that Wildlands Network has just come up with to try to identify regions that will be able to connect up landscapes and allow species to impact dynamically respond to shifts going forward. Um, but the future of conservation does need to consider these dynamic responses. So when we're thinking about restoration, and I'm not saying don't restore places, I'm just saying think about the larger context of whether or not the system should be dynamically shifting or should be needing to stay in the same state. So let's take a step back from the restoration mindset and, and, and keep thinking going forward about the dynamism of the landscapes and the need for things to continue to change in order to survive and in order to thrive. And so uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge our collaborators and again, point out uh, Silvia Pineda Munoz and Yue Wang, whose work I highlighted here. They're my postdocs um, who are finishing up with me in August. And then uh, this is the rest of my lab, the Spatial Ecology and Paleontology Lab, um, my graduate students and some of my undergraduates. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
as a result that fragmentation ends up affecting that, right? So uh, there have been some urban ecology studies that demonstrate that, um, you know, small mammals are in fact able to find, it's, it's also about uh, where they can live, right? So like they're able to live in small, in, in urban areas because they can hide in little holes and they can find nooks and crannies to live in. Whereas what's a bison gonna do in the middle of Juneau, right? Like <laughs> it's not gonna, it's not always gonna sleep in the middle of the street. So I mean, it's not just, it's, it's home range, right? So it's, it's the need to migrate, the need to move, the need to exist, um, but it's also the need to, um, you know, have a, have a hide hole, have a place to live. So, yeah. Yeah. In terms of restoration, have you identified certain habitat types or biomes that should be prioritized over others, or is it more context dependent? Well, so you mean restoration or conservation? So I mean restoration. So I mean, in terms of, it's true that places with more moderate temperatures, more lowland places are, are hugely missing from some of our conservation portfolios, right? So the fact that um, most grasslands have been converted to agricultural fields. Um, but in terms of restoration, I mean, we can look at the different plant biomes and see, you know, some of them, in fact, persist much longer than others. And so the ones that end up being ones that persist for very long time periods end up being uh, the coastal forests of um, uh, coast, so coastal forest ecosystems like uh, redwood forests, things like that. So a restoration perspective would be excellent in that type of uh, ecosystem. And some of the, um, in fact, some of the tundra uh, boreal forest ecosystems uh, end up having very long um, residence times. And so they're ones that are able to persist for a very long time and do persist for a very long time. Um, and so we can have this perspective, at least on those, that one could uh, maintain restoration. Uh, I think that taking a look, you know, uh, pollen, pollen data are in a lot of places. They're not everywhere, they're not ubiquitous. Um, but, you know, having a sense of how dynamically, what's the history of your region and how dynamically places have shifted historically um, is something that's really worth thinking about and worth taking a shot at. Because, you know, I, I can summarize these results, but the reality is if I look at any one core, it tells a different story. And we have a couple of stories like that we kind of put together about some of the national parks, like um, Yellowstone, I think had a residence time of somewhere around um, 170 years, right? It was like surprisingly short, but there's, you know, four cores there and you can look at them and you can see uh, how much the transitions are occurring and uh, that could be an old date, but um, you know, you can actually take a look at specific regions and, and understand the history of those regions a little more. Yeah. I was curious if you looked into um specifically how like a migratory behavior may add complexity to kind of future conservation strategies for mammals in that it sets up dichotomy where perhaps their like summer breeding areas are well protected with lots of corridors, mm. but their winter areas may not be and how that might compare to more like a resident species. Mm -hmm. No, but that's a great idea. That's a good way forward. Uh, yeah, we've been thinking a lot about kind of starting to t look at and test that movement map, right? So like trying to think about, so okay, what are these, what are the predictions of where we think these species are going to need to move? And, uh, and where, versus where they have moved in the past, and that can relate a lot to migration strategies as well, so, yeah. We also thought about including other climate change variables, so you mentioned temperature a lot, and obviously 
it's going to change. But what about like uh, precipitation? So in, in all the studies, we, we did include precipitation, but um, some of them were nuanced to variables. So like seasonality, things like that um, can be a little more tricky in the, in the paleo record. So we have, you know, um, general circulation models that have been projected back in the past and have been made more fine grained. Um, but uh, the, our confidence in some variables is stronger than our confidence in other variables, let's say, right? Yeah. yeah, so that makes sense. But this question, I guess, made me wonder, have you looked at to what extent, say, seasonality is important for some of these species more? You know, I imagine it affects some species more than others. And so do you know how much that's, that might be influencing the results? Um, well, it depends on which results. But um, so let's say for trees, plant species, right? So seasonality can be hugely important, I guess. I guess what ends up being important is like uh, evapotranspiration and uh, like minimum temperature of the year, which are variables that we have been looking at. Um, but we haven't, and, and so we end up including them in the model, but we haven't looked at individual species separately. And I, I think that that's what people are trying to get at because you guys are all in the cons bio community and you're interested in the, the species as individuals and we haven't, yet taken the time to parse those out. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Dr. Barber one more time. We're gonna be doing a uh, happy hour at back streets, so please join us there, hopefully outside.
least a, at least in, so in some species. You know, I'll just get it. I just emailed a lot. Yeah, we don't hear about them. We don't hear about them. We don't hear about them. Oh, you mean like for the, I mean, we're really only considering humans, right? So yeah. we're like looking at the overlap yeah, with human occupancy. <laughs> 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 Community distribution, just like that. So, yeah. We need to decide what the question is. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 he was just yeah. like really just finding the realization that's well up and saying, What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice to meet you. Any schoolwork? Yeah, any project.